begins with another passage by the father of Gerald. And this is Ger Gerald Albert Gallego, I, I think. I think his name is. So, book number two is called The Children. It says, I had my friend stop the car and I got out and walked up to the driver's side where Charlotte was sitting behind the wheel. I loved Charlotte then very much and I still love her. Anyway, I told her that if she didn't come with me, I would do her with great harm. She at first thought I was joking until I hit her in the eye and grabbed for her throat. Gail, the girlfriend, got out of the car and came around to, the, to my side and told me to leave Charlotte alone. I then turned around and slapped her across the mouth and told her if she didn't shut up, I would fix it where she would. By this time, my kid Bud and I got into it because I slapped his girl. We had a big fight, but it was broken up because someone called the cops. The cops. I jumped into Charlotte's car and drove off with her. I jumped, <laughs> that's just, I jumped in the sheriff's car. I can't believe that she would let him back in her vehicle with her. <laughs> that's just crazy. Uh, she was scary. She was crying and I told her to shut up. But after a while, I told her I was sorry. Like how manipulative. Just crazy to me. So, Hadn't she made them known to the family? 
staring at Charlene with frightened, hostile eyes. The scene when she entered the house was right out of dog patch. His mother was kneeling on the floor in the next room, visible through the half-open door, talking into the telephone. Did you get married? Did you? Did you? The grandmother demanded. Charlene said she and Jerry were not married. Well, it's a good thing because there's another woman. The elderly woman's voice was shrill and her eyes were full of anger and dislike. Charlene couldn't understand the change in attitude. What are you talking about? She asked. The elderly woman kept repeating that there was another woman until Jerry's mother came into the room and explained to Charlene that Jerry had made love to Sally Jo and he needed help. She explained that Jerry might kill someone if he didn't get help. Charlene would have been outraged, angered, repulsed, and disgusted with the news. Instead, she stood on the threshold thinking, well, he already has killed somebody. She was angry enough to stalk out of the house to a shed where Jerry was talking to his stepfather. There was no real explanation in her mind for the kind of reception she received at the house, and she intended to inform Jerry he would have to tell his grandmother to watch her language. She wasn't going to be talked to that way. Jerry's stepfather told her she had a lot more to worry about than the old lady's language and language. His wife had called the police, and they had better get out of there, and fast. A hectic scene followed, and Jerry was terrified. He told Charlene to get into the van. Then he sat behind the steering wheel and drove along the gravel lane. As they approached Dayton, Dayton, Dayton Road, where the house was located, Charlene heard Jerry's mother call, get rid of the guns, of the guns. And by the way, I wanted to say, this is just a temporary, like, background. You probably will see it here and there. I sometimes go 
case is as old as the sin of Lot's wife. But it was true in Charlene's case. She knew too much. Clayco could not leave her and let her live. At least the, that is what she told us she thought. Jerry met his mother and a brother at a tavern in Chico. They brought him his money and some clothes, actually. Um, as they parted that evening, Jerry's mother turned to Charlene and said, Take care of my boy. Charlene thought bitterly, What a switch. Jerry changed his mind again the next morning. We can't go anywhere really in that car, he so he told Charlene, and the next morning they were back in Sacramento exchanging the car for the van. Jerry had learned that Charlene's father had connections in Houston, and he told her they would go over there for a little while until he eased, you know, eased up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. The sex warrant in Chico worried him, not the murders in Sacramento. We'll get married in Reno. Reno. In Reno. Charlene was tired of the line. It was the fifth or sixth time that, um, since, you know, they, that they had been living together, that he had mentioned marriage. He kept putting it off. He kept brushing it off and doing that whole thing, and now he's saying this. It'll be the last legal thing you will ever do, he said. I'm going to make a legitimate woman out of you. Wife's 
Joseph's family tree selected the name of a distant relative whom he had been born in Sacramento County and having convinced Charlene's family he had been wrongly accused in Chico, prevailed on her mother to go to the courthouse and get him a copy of the man's birth certificate. My mom would never. She didn't trust the document to the mail. With a friend, she climbed into her car in Sacramento, drove to Houston, and hand delivered Jerry's new identification. Then Caligo began leading a strange double life on the job he was Stephen File, having stolen another man's name and his vital statistics. Among the circle of friends they developed, Jerry and Charlene were the Caligos. It was impossible for Jerry to hold a job permanently. Yeah, got that right. He could make enemies as easily as he made friends. Charlene, alone in Houston apartment most of the time, was lonely but relatively happy. Life with Jerry was going as smoothly as she could expect. She wanted to get a job and finally secured Jerry's permission to apply for work at a bank near their home. She got permission to get a job. Wow. That's crazy. But she was hired immediately. Charlene had her father's talent for business success. Gerald liked the money, but didn't appreciate her Midas touch. Charlene never understood what happened next. Jerry told her that he wanted her to practice to see how fast she could break the house down and be ready to travel. He likes to do this with the women he dates. He, in the meanwhile, fought with a fellow bartender known as Mad Dog and was on the edge of losing his job again. He's already like about to lose two jobs in, a, in one paragraph, y'all. <laughs> Crazy. He came home one day and told her to break the house down. They were returning to California immediately. So, they leave again and they go back to Sacramento. They flew west in a separate aircraft. Charlene never knew why they left so fast or why they had trouble separately, but but instead of California, they went to Reno, Nevada. It was the spring of 1979. Gerald Gallego had never forgotten his fantasy. He began talking about it again. He was watching with speculation and some anticipation the 11-year-old daughter of a man with whom Charlene had become friendly. Jerry, as usual, found work with the help of Charlene's father's influence. Once again, Charlene's dad helps him out. It, that's crazy to me. He worked as a driver for Sparks Meat Distributor. Eventually, he told Charlene he quit. She was never sure that was the truth. Coleco, it seems, was not good at being a truck driver, so he loses that job. I'm literally halfway through the page, and he already lost three jobs. She had walked into another meat company and found her work without any assistance from her influential father. Unlike her husband, she had a knack for getting jobs and keeping them. She also had the ability to make friends with men and enemies of women. She could not understand why the female employees at her new firm seemed to resent her. Neither did she worry about it. She became fast friends with a long-legged sales manager who sat and talked with her over extended lunch hours and cocktails after work. Nothing beyond conversation evolved from the friendship, but, but Charlene, she knew that it would, and it probably would. It would grow into something else. Caligo's hold over her, which seemed almost hypnotic when they first met, was losing its power guilt she shared with him kept her from leaving. The other young woman's marriage and his 11-year-old daughter had nothing to do with her feelings about him. Charlene had never believed in the total sanctity 
shops and booths along the midway. I'm taking them back to the van to get more leaflets, she called. Jerry heard and followed. Charlene climbed into the van with the girls, and then he was standing beside her, holding a gun, one of the guns. Maybe she gave him the thirty-eight. Perhaps he was holding the Derringer. She was living in that strange, two-planed world again, one in which she watched and the other of words in action. But she never quite made it to the watching plane in time to remember exactly how he got the gun. A bed had been added to the van, and Jerry told the girls to lie face down on the springs with its single thin pad and two blankets, one plaid and the other bright yellow. The girls obeyed. They stared at the threatening little hole at the end of the barrel, which... Um, so... He had this gun pointed at them, and they were just shocked. It's like, shit, we gotta follow directions, you know? So the girls obeyed, and um, the color had then drained from their faces, and they were trembling, and tears were squeezed from their eyes. But they did what they were told, lying quietly on the blankets while Galego bound them hand and foot. One of the girls, a slender, fair brunette with long, dark hair that almost reached her waist, vomited. She gasped gasped and gagged and choked, but Charlene did not hear that. She saw that the girl was sick and wanted to help her because she knew Jerry became angry when anyone was sick. A sick, sweet odor of vomit and sex dominated the air in the van. Charlene was sitting in a chair on the driver's side and she reached across the tight little enclosure and t told the girl that she would be all right, repeating it again and again while they rode out of the lot and towards the freeway. I-80 and Sparks. Before they reached the freeway, Jerry stopped the van in the parking lot of a supermarket, leaving Charlene to watch over the girls. She was back on the ice chest, still stroking the girl with the long brown hair now, now and then, and, you know, telling her it would be all right. But she stayed in the van, waited in the van, and never moved from the ice chest until Jerry returned after a fairly short absence. He was carrying a shovel, a long-handed shovel, with a blade that was a golden color as though, as though it had been, like, gilded. He stopped at the store to buy the shovel. Not only the shover, shovel, but a hammer as well. Galego put them in the back of the van on the side away from the bed. Then he sat down beside the steering wheel and drove to I-80 and then east out of Sparks. Charlene sat on the ice chest and looked at the shovel with its golden blade and the hammer gleaming and new under transparent plastic wrapping. Once again, she felt her in stroking the head of the girl who had been sick, the girl with the long brown hair that almost reached her waist. You'll be all right, she murmured. Everything will be all right. There was a sharp, ringing sound in the back of the van as it passed over a rare pothole in the road, and the head of the hammer met the blade of the shovel. So now we are at chapter three. The short desert twilight had dropped over Washoe County as the van moved east towards I-80, or along I-80. Charlene noticed the street lights had been turned on in sparks as they passed the nugget. Later, when they drove through Mustang, she wrecked auto the wrecked automobiles at the side of the road were humpbacked shadows, and all that really was visible on top of the hill, where the trailers waited for men with sex drives and fat wallets, was a single light. Jerry joked about that as he drove past Amlet. The sight of the farmed, a famed whorehouse awakened Jerry's personal urges. The van was only a few miles past Mustang when he ordered Charlene to change sh uh, seats with him, which she did. They traded places without stopping. Jerry in the back with the girls began giving orders to the new slaves. Get in trust, he demanded. Take your clothes off. In the rear vision mirror, Charlene could see enough to know the girls had stripped their brassiers and panties and then stopped. Take it off. Jerry ordered, take everything off, take it all off. Then the 
girls were down on the floor and out of her line of sight in the rear vision mirror, but she was able to see that they were both naked before lying down. Jerry had to untie them, and he was very polite about it while he stared down at them and talked, either to himself or Charlene, about their figures. She heard him remarking on how well constructed they were, and then the sounds of sex. It was never completely dark. A full moon rose over the rolling desert hills and saturated the county side with its clear white light. She could see enough to know he was raping the girls one at a time or maybe both at once, but she couldn't tell which. Just kidding. She waited in 
she waited in the dark while the girl with the long brown hair huddled nude on the floor of the van was right at her feet. She stroked the girl's hair and reassured her. Everything will be all right. Charlene told her again, everything will be fine. The girl was huddled at her feet, crying softly, ever so softly, and looking up at her now and then with eyes which were filled with a mixture of like anger and also fear. Charlene reached down and touched her hair. That's okay, honey. You'll be all right. Maybe she meant it. Charlene was concerned about the girl with the long brown hair, and she actually wanted to help her. Then Jerry was back with them. Charlene had forgotten the other girl by then. She wasn't even, like, in her mind. The important issue was the girl with the long brown hair. She reached down and could feel the girl's damp cheeks. Jerry looked at the girl and said, Come on, you're next. No, Charlene objected. I don't want you to take her. Maybe she surprised herself, actually. She wanted to touch the girl again, to tell her it would be all right, that it was going to be okay and not to worry. And then Jerry was just, he was snarling at her. She could see the girl's eyes and that she was still crying softly, ever so softly. But her eyes reflected anger instead of grief and fear. The teenager was angry and outraged. Jerry took the girl away while Charlene watched numbly. When he killed the girl, he would be killing her. He went away with the girl. When he returned a short while later, he was carrying a hammer and shovel and he was alone. Charlene looked at him and hated him. For the first time in her life, she hated him. She stared at him with angry, pale blue eyes and asked a question she knew was hardly necessary. Well, did you kill her? Yeah, I killed her. I'll kill you too. It was a possibility she could not overlook. She stood in the moonlight, hating him, but she knew he would kill her also if he thought it would get him anything. Now we are on to chapter four. Jerry put the shovel away and seated himself behind the steering wheel of the van. Charlene sat behind him. Her mind was uh, partially numb, partly angry. She was hating him. There had been this invisible bond between her and the girl with the long brown hair. She ignored Coleco, staring slightlessly off over the floor of the narrow valley. The van crumbled to life and then it moved back over the graveled road towards Haiti. Jerry stopped somewhere short of the freeway near a telephone pole and got out for a while. Charlene saw him move toward the pole, but she was in another world. She didn't pay any attention to what she was doing, to what, to what he was doing out there. Never was the possibility of kidnapping or murder mentioned, at least not with the families of the two girls. Neither family gave up hope. When, as the months blended and became years, the police effort appeared to have exhausted all normal courses, the families continued their search. One of the young women's families spent weeks at the Lake Tahoe area, combing resort after resort, and one casino after another. So, there, there had been, you know, sightings of the two girls apparently reported all over the West, but Brenda Judd and Sandra Colley were never found. In November 1st, 1980, 18 months after the two girls had disappeared, um, their families were still looking for them and still believing they would find them and never once were mentioning death. In Sacramento, we continued to work on the Vought Scheffler murders. Hot pursuit cooled, as it always will, when a case gets old and the trails become worn and trampled. I believe with most other homicide investigators that the best way to solve a murder is to get as many men on the case as possible within hours after the crime. Usually, the system works. It did not in the case of Kippy Vaught and Rhonda Scheffler. Unlike the Reno Police Department, we knew Rhonda and Kippy had been murdered and we had a lead, one that looked very good. Person after person claimed to have seen the two girls at the shopping center. Enough of them claimed that they had ridden away with two black men in a maroon-covered colored automobile, either this Pontiac Firebird or the Chevrolet Camaro, to convince everyone that um, was concerned with the investigation that, you know, this is what happened. It had to be what happened. So, unlike... Um, Sorry, we found a man who had been seen with them at the plaza. He told about meeting them 
his Miranda rights before questioning him. Eventually, we were convinced that he was telling the truth. When we located the boys' camp counselor, we knew he was lying to us because his story changed from one minute to another. He was too, um, as raised of the rights, but we never found solid enough evidence to convict him of the murders either. As the investigation progressed, we became increasingly sure that he had not committed them. That, too, is the job of a homicide investigator. I have always believed that we must not only be able to find the guilty, but establish an innocent person's lack of guilt. In late June of 1979, when Brenda Judd and Sandra Colley were kidnapped, we were still following leads in the Fod Scheffler investigation, giving it all, all the time our schedule would allow. Homicides are not committed on a set schedule. They are not disturbed evenly over a period of time. They come in bunches sometimes, so our small detail is bursting at the seams with work. There are periods between these bursts of activity when we have time to go over the stubborn mysteries which frustrate all, our, all of our attempts to solve the murders. Our experience, skill, science, and technical knowledge seems useless, but we continue to work, and sometimes a crack appears in the puzzle's protective shield. 